by Benning. Darnell Nurse left it in the corner, gets up center. Perry scoops. Corey Perry. Well, you able to shake away from Solani. It's given away to Solani around in front. Score! Tamu Solani with the steal. Three of the fans won one. Score! And we are back with the Forever Mighty Podcast on a Monday night edition of the show. Steven and Eddie on the mics. Uh, man, what what a game. 48-15 to 15 are the final shots tonight for the Avalanche. Could have been 50. They got they got fairly close. Um, and it could have been 70. Is there a difference between 48 and 70 tonight? Not really. When you look at the final score line, right? You know, and, and the thing is, you like you look at this game. The Ducks were in it for, you know, it, the score line was close. So Tori Terry's goal in the third cut at the three two, but it was like, right when Terry scored, the Avs were like, oh okay, okay, we're gonna wake back up now. <laughs> and then mm-hmm. They just took back control of the game. Like I don't think I've ever seen a team like that in a while that can just click at that level the way the Avs are clicking right now where, you know, they clearly took their foot off the gas up 3-1 going into the third period. Uh, Terry's goal kind of comes off a broken play, and they're like, oh, okay, well, now we're just going to put three more past just so we can rest our rest our guys for the rest of the night here and <laughs> move on to the next game. It's uh, the, the age-old tale of, you know, one of those teams who's right on the cusp of being a Stanley Cup contending team or, or, you know, competing for a Stanley Cup versus a team that is, is in the bottom and really starting things from the beginning. And you can, you can see the golfing class between, you know, where the abs yeah. are right now and where the ducks are. And, you know, it gives you some hope that eventually the, the ducks can get to that. Cause it's not so long ago that the avalanche were in the similar position that the ducks were. Uh, and they were trying to build around Nathan McKinnon and Gabriel Landis cog. And, you know, the pieces have finally fallen into place, but, uh, man, this, uh, you know, as, as shitty as this loss was, you you can't you can't argue how fun the Avs are to watch as a team. You know, it sucks when they're doing it against you, but uh, they're just uh, an unreal team to watch. There you go, everybody. You guys say Eddie isn't positive. All we have to do is trade away our Ryan O'Reilly and our Matt Deshane, and then someday we too <laughs> get two first overall picks, and <laughs> we can yeah, <laughs> then we can someday too turn into a team with. Uh, a heart and a Norris trophy, uh, or a, probably multiple heart and Norris uh, contenders, yeah. quality players at least. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, it's it's insane. I also think, you know, uh, having come from the game uh, yesterday, I think it's a lot to switch to this, which was such a downer. Um, you know, but uh, yeah, you know, we know that contention and the teams in contention is cyclical in this league, and we know that the Ducks need to start building back up, trying to get there. Um, you know, there are arguments about which way to go and all that stuff, which we have all the time and stuff, but I, I does feel like everybody kind of recognizes what's going on. You know, I think <clears throat> um, I had wanted to talk about this um, Friday and didn't get to, uh, but there was a quote in the uh drance and lebron article about the having execs makes trades and stuff like that where one of them flat out said bob murray won't say it but he is rebuilding and we know he likes to trade for draft picks and i thought having an a a, 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 a fellow nhl executive say that was very telling um and you know it makes me kind of wonder why bob murray won't say that to the fan base but at least there is a perception among the people who matter yeah um, that he does understand and appreciate the situation. Yeah, I mean, that's what we hope. We, we're going to get to that article later today as well because uh, one of the trade suggestions in that article was about Ryan Miller and a uh, potential destination for him. So we'll we'll revisit that article once we get to the post-game notes here. But we do kind of have two games to recap because this was a back-to-back, a little bit unorthodox back-to-back this year, but it was the Blues on Sunday night and the Avs obviously tonight. The Ducks pulled out a 3-2 overtime victory against the St. Louis Blues on Sunday night, and Anthony Stolarz started that game and actually looked pretty good. You know, I can't discredit the mm-hmm. way he played in that game, and you know, with Miller or sorry, with Gibson down, 
you can't play Miller every game, and especially on the back-to-back, Stoolers was going to have to get in here at some point. So a nice uh, debut from him, a nice kind of comeback win for the Ducks, down 2 nothing to come back and win that game. It's not the typical St. Louis Blues we're used to by any means. They've been on a, a pretty poor stretch themselves, and injuries have kind of hampered their success that they had earlier on in the season. But it was a nice win for the Ducks to, to kind of have one of those bounce-back wins and and uh, kind of come from behind, which is something we haven't seen for them from a while. But you got a whole different animal here uh, the night after against the Avalanche, especially with some tired legs. But I think the theme of these two games here was goaltending. You know, Stolar's performance in the game against the Blues, and Ryan Miller was exceptional tonight. You know, there's five goals on the board, but he had 43 saves. And uh, yeah. he this this game could have been like the last one. That was 8-4. to four. Like, this could have been a 8, 9, 10, 11 goal game if Ryan Miller wasn't playing as well as he did. Like, there was several times the Avs had some chances that were just about to cross the line, but Ryan Miller made some exceptional saves. It, it was... Uh, an excellent performance from him, and probably one of the best performances I've seen from a goalie in a while that's still allowed five goals in a game. <laughs> yeah, no, it, uh, it 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 didn't feel like he let in five goals. It feels like he got left out to dry five times and they converted. Um, you know, I, uh, I think, the, you know, you kind of look at tonight and how Ryan Miller was able to take at least a little bit of a break and kind of compose himself i don't i don't want to say like he's like frantic or anything but i just think like mentally it's very stressful uh, you know i think goalies are already um notoriously kind of like head casey kind of players because it's such a an independent position in such a team game um but i think on top of that like being a goalie for a bad team that's got to be a lot you know and just you know you're getting 30 shots 35 shots every night no matter what um you know, having Stolarz come in, and Stolarz has, you know, a little bit of extra energy, a little bit of jump in his system. I think it was only his second career start. Uh, it's his first one for Anaheim. I think his only other one came for Philadelphia. Um, you know, and he was excited. He's got something to prove. Gibby's hurt. Ryan Miller hasn't looked great. Uh, so, you know, he's definitely looking to play himself into an opportunity to get more games. And I think what we saw is he played well, and he deserved an opportunity to play some more of those games, especially in a season uh, where there's really no reason to run anybody into the ground. There's no reason to play any of these guys on any more than they have to. Um, He's auditioning for the backup job next year too, right? Like any performance yeah, he gets now fair, is yeah. Ryan Miller's likely not coming back. Um, by the end of this season, he's probably going to have done everything he wanted to do in terms of breaking records and setting the amount of wins that he wants to finish his career on and whatnot. Um, so for Stolarz, any chance he gets to jump into the Ducks lineup here is is an audition uh, to kind of step into the front of the line to be the backup goalie next year. You know, I think Dostal is right behind him, but uh, he needs a little bit more time. And, it, and I think the plan for Dostal next year is full-time AHL gig, where there is no taxi squad next year, and he can be, uh, you know, a 1-2 down there with Ole Eriksson Ek. It's been a kind of a tough year for mm-hmm. Dostal in the sense that, you know, with a goaltender injured, somebody has to stay in the taxi squad, and uh, they've kind of volunteered Lucas Dostal for that role. Uh, unfortunate for him, but you know it is a good, uh, good audition period period here for Anthony Stolarz because I think he he still is you know has the potential to be a quality NHL goaltender in, in a backup role. I don't think he's ever going to be a, yeah. a starter, but you you know every time I've seen him come in, he hasn't looked awkward. You know he hasn't looked horrible in the net. He's looked comfortable and and you know that's all you can really ask from your backup. That's all we've asked from Ryan Miller. And, uh, you know, the team looks comfortable playing in front of Miller every time he's out there. So that's, uh, you know, hopefully all we can get from Anthony Stolarz, too. Yeah, no, I think, you know, what... um, I think with um, Stolarz, it's one of those things. I just think you can see what makes him so uh, such an attractive, like, prospect. You know, he's a big guy. He takes up a lot of the net. And he doesn't... I didn't feel like he took himself out of the play at all last night. And I think... You know, when you're looking at a backup goaltender, that's kind of what you want, and that's kind of the guys that you have to hit on, uh, you know, when you're trying to have that kind of organizational depth. Um, so I definitely think there's a lot of reasons to, to be optimistic and to give him more uh, give him more starts going throughout the year and to see if maybe into the summer you don't have to worry 
about signing a goaltender for sure. You know what I mean? I think there's always going to be the option, the, the opportunity for him to get taken in the expansion draft, depending on whatever. And if he looks good enough to be a very good backup, there's no reason to think, you know, uh, Seattle wouldn't be interested. But I think he played well enough and he's earned the opportunity to, to be kind of first in line for the backup gig next year. I think we we got to get into what was the major talking point at the beginning of this game. Uh, Zegers was scratched in, in the game against St. Louis, yeah. and you know he's been scratched in back to backs before. Usually it was the second game, so it wasn't you know too much to read into it. Last game where you kind of felt like okay they're deciding to scratch him against St. Louis and they'll throw him against Colorado and things will be back to normal. And then we get to tonight and find out Trevor Zegers is scratched again. And not only is he scratched, Sam Steele is scratched out of the lineup too. And the guys who check in are Nick Delorier and Andrew Agazino are the guys who check in for uh, Zegers and Sam Steele. It, it, it's just become such a, a gimmick at this point. And then also the Ducks run 11 forwards and 7th defensemen on, uh, for the second night in a row too. And Andy Walensky gets in as the seventh guy, which again, the argument last game was, why would you play Andy Walensky seven minutes a night when you could play Trevor Zegers out there instead? Uh, and then tonight, you know, Larson comes out, Drysdale comes back in, but again, Walensky is still the seventh man of this decor. And it's, it's unbelievable to me at this point. Uh, you know, we, we say every, every show when something ridiculous happens, there's no way it can get worse from here. There's no way they can mess it up more than this. And they just seem to find ways to just butcher it even more. And, you know, the the argument that, uh, I don't know, maybe not the argument, but the explanation that was given on the broadcast um, is that they're managing his games played so that he's eligible for the normal 27-year-old UFA status after his eighth season, which would be the 2027-2028 season. If he gets in a crude season this year and qualifies every subsequent year after, he would be eligible for UFA status a year earlier in his seventh season, which is 2026-2027. And in a crude season, uh, meaning being on the 23-man roster, uh, which is reduced from 40 games to 27 for this year. He's played 15, so he'd have to play 12 more to be uh, considered in a crude season and be effective for this. So essentially, this seems the reasoning that they have scratched him for this game. Presumably, that means they can only play him 11 more games out of the 20 games this season. So there's not that many back-to-backs left, which is why we see a back-to-back scratch here. Uh, it, it's getting kind of ridiculous and, and uh, you know, sadistically comical at this point uh, that Trevor Zegers keeps finding his way out of the lineup because of situations that could happen seven or eight years down the road. Yeah. Uh, you know, I look, I just think, uh, we should appreciate this is the kind of long-term vision and asset management uh, that we have been looking for in this franchise. We've wanted to see somebody have a plan. Uh, and the fact that Bob Murray thinks he's going to be around 27 uh, and have to worry about that, I-, I think positive, guys. I think what we need to do is start appreciating this general manager group uh Bob Murray, really, for having that kind of long-term vision here that is going to put this team uh, in a position to compete with Edmonton and <laughs> Buffalo when they If you didn't sense again. the sarcasm and, before that, you, you give, you've blown your cover now. <laughs> I, I, you know, it's one, like, I don't know, man. It's one of those things for me that's so frustrating because it's like, this is kind of the one that broke me because I feel like I've been a little bit willing almost honestly eager to give Aikens a little bit of slack here and it just hasn't worked I just I don't know what this is tonight you know I I just have no idea what these lineups are becoming you know I think the 11 and the 7 thing is a little bit much I think it highlights the lack of impactful forwards and I think it also highlights the lack of defensive depth like we have seven defenders but we don't have seven good defenders you know um it's just so weird at this point I'm not you know like we said I think uh Saturday or Sunday when we were talking it kind of felt obvious that what it was was Manson 
being given an opportunity to work himself back into shape with the team. And now I, I don't know what the argument is. Um, yeah. I mean, we kind of joked that winning those two games against St. Louis, Aikens in his mind is just like, okay, yeah, this is why I did it. And then Drysdale getting hurt in that last game, um, not not on Sunday's game, but the game before that, the Ducks went from you know having seven down to six, which didn't hurt them as much defensively because they could still roll six defensemen. And you know Dallas Aikens is putting a check mark beside, okay, 11 forward, seven defensemen. It worked. This is why we do it. it it's just become you know a meme uh, that that seems to draw on, and uh, it, it's so painful every night. Like you you know it's gonna happen, and they're gonna go to, it and we're gonna get the announcement that they're doing eleven forward and seven defensemen. I just don't honestly don't know how we got here. Like like you said, I mean, it seemed like in the originally it was because they were working Josh Manson back into full health, and they were playing seventh defenseman, and Josh was the seventh guy. He played like seven or eight minutes a night. And that was the reasoning for it, which I was fine with. Like, it's still a dumb decision. You might as well just not play Josh until he's fully healthy. But if you want to work him back to full health and get, you know, play him six, seven minutes a night, and that's the way you want to do it, sure, that's fine. But now, you know, Josh is fully healthy. He's clearly mm-hmm. fine. He scored the OT winner on Sunday night against the St. Louis Blues. There's nothing wrong with him. He's even played in a game where the Ducks have played six defensemen so far this year. Where they started the game with six defensemen, he played with Jamie Drysdale. So it's not like they're working him back to full health at this point. Right. I don't. I don't know why. Like, it, I, there's not many things I've ever sat here and said I. I can't really explain why the coach is doing Dude. this and why it's something he keeps going back to. But this is this is definitely one of the first times where I I don't have an explanation of why he keeps going back to it. Are we sure Dallas Aikens isn't a big baseball fan and he's just like over managing the bullpen with his defensemen? Like at this point, doesn't it just feel like, you know, Andy Walensky is out there against left handed centers who can hit a slider oh or some God. stupid shit? Like it just. <laughs> I didn't like think I about that, that, but that would be amazing. I hung on so long for him, like, trying to give him the benefit of the doubt that he was in a weird spot and the season was weird. And, you know, I don't think the the roster construction is great. Uh, I don't think, you know, he's not being given the best tools to work with. But he is certainly not making his life any easier. And I am just not sure what he thinks he's doing. But I, I honestly almost wish that it was something like that, right? Like... Oh, uh, we're playing, you know, San Jose and Logan Couture is out there. And actually, Andy Walensky and Jacob Larson are the perfect pair for him. So I'm going to play those two guys right yeah. now. You know, if there's some actual strategy I, behind it. <laughs> I, I, would, I would so prefer some just ridiculous galaxy brain ass explanation. Like, it's so, the th- it's just so strange. The thing is, I don't know it, how else to say you it. You know, if you had... If the, the forwards you were leaving out of the lineup were guys like Andrew Agazino and Nick Deloria to play 11 forward, 7 defenseman, I'd be like, okay, whatever. It's, you know, moving the deck chairs at that point. The the impact that Agazino or Deloria is going to have over Andy Belinsky, it's not a big one. But when the forwards you're leaving out of the lineup are Danton Heinen or Trevor Zegris or Sam Steele to make a change and have seven defensemen in there and then just in general you're going against one of the best teams in the nhl and you say okay we're going to take sam Steele out we're going to throw a, a guy who's played one nhl game this year and is a mm-hmm. decent ahl player in, in agazino out there we're going to throw nick delorie on our top line and not going to bring trevor zegris back into a game where the ducks offense has been the best this year against one team and one team only, and that's the Colorado Avalanche. Why would you not throw the guy who can create the most offense for you <laughs> against? Because we don't like need that? him, obviously. Save him. Save him for those very hard to beat teams like Los Angeles. <laughs> you know, the, San Jose. The, the thing for this, uh, for me, in in all of this is, you know, if you want to do this with Trevor Zegers, fine. If you want to not play him and you don't want him to hit UFA status a year early. Fine, send him to the AHL, get him some games, but keeping him on the taxi yeah. squad to do this, I, I don't so, understand. Like there, there's there's no benefit to this. If if he's not gonna play, play him, send him to San Diego. You can bring him up. You know, send him to San Diego for a couple of games if you know he's not gonna play. Bring him back up uh, to the taxi squad and to the NHL squad for whatever game you want to play him in, and work it like that. If you have eleven games set for him that you want him to play in, get him some playing time because. He has now sat for the last two games. He's he's been out of you know 
game time decisions for for the last four or five days, and I just don't see how this is any benefit to him. Like again, like I said, I have no problems if you, the approach you want to take is you don't want to play him this year to avoid that you know eight the, the eighth year of UFA status going to seven years. You know, it, it's I can understand the rationale behind that decision, even though it's way 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 in the future and it shouldn't impact your decisions on a young player. I can at least like make the connection for why you might want to do that if you're looking way long term down the road. But then get this guy some some fucking games, play him in the AHL. So yeah, so I've been, uh, this is one of those things because I uh, I don't remember when this came this came up earlier. Somebody I made the same comment you did. If this is what you're gonna do, send him to San Diego. And the thing I was thinking about is, uh, and, and I, if you just say we have a four week period and there's twelve. 12- 12 games for San Diego to play and 12 games for um, Anaheim to play. How is it for him to play all 12 games in San Diego versus eight games in Anaheim spread out a little and still get the practices in against NHL sized individuals? Uh, How big is that difference? Do we think? Because I do think we have said multiple times that um, he's clearly above AHL level. And uh, let me be very clear here real quick. I want to say, I don't think this is what Aikens is doing. I don't think this is the way that he's going about it. I'm just genuinely asking because I think it raises an interesting question when everybody is saying, just send him down. Is it better to get three or four more games in a month? against lesser competition or is it better to play higher competition level games i i would agree with that and and maybe change it to this so if if they're gonna follow this structure here where he can't hit 27 games this year he only can play 11 more the ducks have 20 games would you rather him play 11 out of the ducks final 20 games and then be in the press box or practice whatever for those remaining nine that are you know spread out throughout the year they scratch him every you know every other game or every two games or would you rather him in san diego playing 20 to 25 games in that span rather than 11 nhl games because i think when you say 12 and 12 or 8 and 12 it's a little bit you know and it's scratched here and there it's it's a little bit easier to say okay yeah for sure i'd rather him in the nhl but he's gonna play just over 50 percent of the remaining games in, in the right. NHL season, if the Ducks are going to follow this, which it seems that they are, or at least they are. I mean, why would the broadcast put it out there? The broadcast, like somebody pointed out on Twitter today, is basically the PR mouthpiece of the Ducks franchise. Right. Why put that broadcast out there if you're not trying to send a message to the fans on this is why we're we're scratching him and he's not playing tonight? Uh, they made they had a whole huge bit on explaining why they're managing his ice time. Uh, it, it really did feel like a, a big PR move there. So it's like, are you going to play him 52% of the games that you have remaining, or can he play 100% yeah. of the AHL games in that time period? I think that's where the, the question gets a little bit murkier and a bit closer to, to leaning towards AHL time, even though I do think his, you know, he's best served playing NHL games right now. But if he's only going to play in half of the games you have left right. and then in the press box for the other half, what's better for his development at that point? Yeah, no, I think the that's a good point. I mean, at that point, it, it almost would make more sense to just let him either run off 10 games and do it uh, and send him back down or to send him down and bring him up to run off the last 10 games. Yeah. Uh, you know, because I think like 19 of the last 10 games are against St. Louis anyways. So, <laughs> um, or L.A. because I think St. Louis and Arizona play each other. Yeah, like that, that L.A. five-game stretch I think has been reduced to four four games and i'm not sure with uh, i haven't checked the that far ahead in the schedule since some of the previous other schedule changes so it's i think it's still four in a row against the kings but yeah like it 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 somebody asked in the chat here like do you think the ducks have a plan i think they have a loose plan and that's to not play trevor zegers more than 26 games this year uh but de- you know determining what games they're going to get him in or get him out of i i don't know if there is a plan you know, thinking that far ahead that we're going to play him in these ones, we're not going to play him on these ones, and where we're not playing him, where is he going to be? Is he going to be practicing with the team? Is he going to be on the taxi squad? Is he going to be in right. San Diego? It They probably do. And I maybe I'm not giving the in NHL organization enough credit here on how they're managing a player, but it does seem a lot of times like they're flying by the seat of their pants and they're just making decisions on a, on a yeah. basis that, that don't make a ton of sense. Like, 
even outside of Zegras tonight, Andrew Agazino coming in for Sam Steele against the Colorado Avalanche. Sam Steele has not been great, but I, I just don't see the benefit there. I really don't. I don't see it. I, 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 so, uh, it's there's a couple different things I want to talk about. But uh, as far as Agazino is concerned, like, I kind of looked at this lineup tonight, to be honest, and was like, oh, this is a show-off game. Like, they're just being like, Half of these guys are available if you want them, you know. Um, I don't know why else Agazino comes up over Steele. I don't. I think that makes a lot of sense for why Heinen has started to kind of work his way back in. I think he's been in the last two games, um, you know. So I, I wonder if that's part of it. Uh, the other part of it is it's like I, I don't know that playing Steele over Agazino is going to make a difference to a degree yeah. that it's. It's 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 you know it's unthinkable to yeah, do. It's not going to hurt the Ducks for sure. It's not like Sam Steele is yeah, putting up points know, so on a nightly I, basis. You know, and it's not like they brought up Agazino and gave him ten games in a row and just told Sam Steele like sit there and feel bad about yourself. Like you know what I mean? Like uh, so, I think I think what it kind of all gets to is there is a lack. Honestly, the front office just has a lack of equity with the fan base right now. You know, as much as they may have a plan they have handled themselves at least publicly in a way that makes it very hard to feel confident that they are thinking far ahead that they are making decisive plans and and i think that's kind of what it is you know especially with you tied that with the other the other quote from that executive where it's like even if you won't say it publicly well why wouldn't you say it publicly i'm not asking for a letter right i I understand that some people think that's tacky and it sends the wrong message and all this stuff. Like, I really don't care that much. But I would just like an interview that's very straightforward where he says, Yeah. We know this is where we're at. We know, you know what I mean? And like the LeBron interview kind that's what I'm of. Saying. He that. sat down with LeBron, but even then, it wasn't. He still was. There was yeah. some hints towards things we haven't heard from him before where, you know, looking at picks and he's like, I can't just. I can't just get all picks. I got to get some prospects, and there were some like little tidbits we haven't heard before. But it wasn't like, uh, you know, I I I've realized we're kind of in a rebuild here, and we're looking to sell players off, and and you know that's the direction we're going. Uh, there there hasn't been any of that. And like I said, like you said, I no, I don't need a letter. I don't need a Rangers esque letter or Senators type letter that comes out and says, oh, you know, sorry to the fans, this is the direction we're going to go in, blah blah blah. Like I I really don't care. I don't need that, but. There, when he does sit down in these interviews, I would love to see some mention of you know the Ducks being a rebuilding team, not what we heard at the beginning of the season where he sat down and said they were he thought they were a win now team, like that's that's the problem is when you sit down and, and you hear those things and I think the way you put it there is, is uh, with the equity that the or the front office has with the fans right now, and how that impacts you know our anger at certain decisions you know, like like. You know, we were saying, I don't think the Agazino for Steel substitution is really one that we can sit back and say, oh, my God, that's so ridiculous. I, I don't know why he's doing that. Right. You know, all things considered, it really isn't that big a remove. Sam Steele hasn't been playing that great. So you can justify it as, you know, a, another healthy scratch for a guy who isn't playing well to bring in a guy and see what you can get out of him. You know, it's not uh, it's not something we're not used to at this point i think if the ducks were playing fairly well and sam Steele was a guy who wasn't performing it'd be like okay whatever like let's see what agazino can do you know maybe he's got some energy trying to show up um you know to show he deserves to be in the lineup and, and be a guy who can stick around so uh, you know all things considered it's not that bad of a move but when it's coupled with the fact that you know everybody hates the owner or not the ownership of the front office group right now and then trevor zegers being scratched for back-to-back games and then that that uh that image comes up on the broadcast and, and kind of blows up on Twitter yeah. a little bit. And you add all those things together and it's like every little move now is like, Oh God, why are you doing this? That's stupid. That's ridiculous. And, and you know what, to be fair, the, the management in the front office has done this to themselves because no, they haven't given us a reason given the fans a reason to trust the direction that they're taking at this point. So every decision becomes a little bit overblown, but you know, for good reason. Yeah, I mean, like the other, that's the, it's not even that, you know, I, the other problem is just, it's not even like they can't ask the fans to trust the plan. It's, 
They're just telling the fans, we've got it handled. And you can go sit over there and wait. You know, there there isn't any communication. And so, you know, I mean, me and you have talked about this. Uh, you know, we talked about this in August about how it's just so many half in, half out kind of moves that don't paint a clear picture collectively of a franchise headed in a single direction with intent. It, it really does feel like they're trying to walk both sides of the lines. And so I, I don't know, you know, I, look, let me say it this way. The trade deadline is going to be a big thing. If he is going to earn back any of that equity that he's going to have to make uh, the trade deadline pretty a significant day for Anaheim, because I think it would be very hard for the Samuelis to bring him back if he doesn't do anything, simply based on how uh, everything is going to go. Uh, like, with the fans, right? Like, if there's if it's a really inactive, like, all 25 of us Ducks fans are going to be pretty pissed. Um, so I, I do think that, you know, because like we said before, like, we're starting to see more attention from the outside media and even from the local media as far as Eric Stevens and, you know, uh, Helene Elliott has not been particularly <laughs> impressed with Ducks' season. Um, I, there's a lot going on here, and they honestly could be t- playing themselves out of a job more so than they're playing themselves into a job, a- assuming, you know, that they might be both have a chance at staying next yeah, year. Yeah, like, at, at the end of the day, sometimes, you know, the, the press can be a deciding factor in mm-hmm. you know, either guys getting fired or decisions being made. And we know the Ducks ownership group doesn't like bad press and doesn't like being a part of bad press. Uh, they don't like looking bad. They don't like looking stupid. Uh, and this is, you know, the first year where we've seen some, you know, big figures in Ducks media criticizing the ownership group mm-hmm. and the, the, you know, the front office group and Eric Stevens has kind of been the spearhead of that. And it, it's been refreshing to see, to be honest with you, you know, mm-hmm. that side uh, of Eric Stevens and, and his reporting and, and a lot of other people out there as well, where, you know, they've all been openly critical of the, the Ducks management staff and their ownership group, which is for good reason for sure this year. And, uh, you know, when you're talking about whether guys could, get fired in the off season or in, in Murray's case promoted to vice president <laughs> of, of hockey operations. Uh, I was chatting with a friend of the show, Ken uh, throughout the week about, you know, those things and, and kind of what could happen with the ducks front office. And, and it, uh, it, it's weird that in a season of how bad the ducks have been, that there still isn't like that confidence that both of these guys are going to be gone at the end of the season. Like there still is that yeah. belief that, I, and, and that they could come back. Like they could be here next year because I don't know if the ownership group is really going to step up and, you know, likely not fire Murray, but like we said, promote him into a different position and then bring in another general manager. There's no way that they're going to pay two guys. You know, they're not going to fire Murray and then, pay another GM and pay two guys for the rest of the of next season. That's definitely something that they're not going to do. So if Murray is gone, it is that type of promotion thing where they're paying him for something else and then they're bringing in a new GM and, and paying a GM there. I, I don't think they would ever um, you know, pay two guys and one of them not being with the organization. And then from there, you know, Aiken's decision really comes down to if there's a new GM in place, I, I think if Bob Murray's there, I don't think he fires Dallas Aikens. That's not a good look for him at this point to fire another head coach uh, under his tenure. It, it really isn't. So you get to that point, like you look at, you know, the Sabres and some of the worst teams in this league and, and how a lot of them have kind of made moves, uh, whether it be coaching fires or, or, you know, kind of directional moves to a, a different general manager. The Ducks are one of those only teams that are near the bottom there where you're sitting and thinking, these guys could still be around. And, and I don't think you can say that for many really bad teams in this league, uh, that you, you don't have the confidence that uh, the general manager and the coaching staff aren't going to be there next year. Yeah, it, it's, it's interesting. I was thinking, I'm trying to think about it right now, and I'm trying to decide if I think two years is long enough to make a decision on Aikens. And I think it, at this point... I think this season it has two. shown that it should be. Yeah, I think that's a, the, exactly the right way to say it. I think at this point there is enough evidence to say that it should probably be the end for him, which is a bummer. Like, I really 
wanted it to go well for him. Um, but it just doesn't seem to be working right now. And as much as I have some uh, reservations in putting it all on him, because I do think there is a part of this that is on Bob Murray and the internal parts of the conversation and the relationship that we just are, have no idea about. Um, he's not helping himself. You know, it was kind of like, you know, yesterday during the game, Danton Heinen just made a dumb play. And my, I made a joke just like, don't make it easy for them to scratch you, right? Don't give them something to point to to be able to go, well, this is why we scratched him. And I just feel like it's kind of the same thing. Um, that You know what I mean? I just think it's kind of the same thing. Um, That's I, I joked today when yeah. Heinen scored that, you know, uh, now that he's going to get scratched because he scored in this game. But he, he, like, I wouldn't be surprised if he was scratched in the next game. Because yeah. you know the broadcast, I was I had to watch the the Avs broadcast tonight because uh, I had some some streaming issues. But the Avs broadcast mentioned how Danton Heinen has been kind of an Avs killer this year. Where every time the Ducks have played the Avs, Danton Heinen has looked like uh, you know the, the player we all hoped he would be, and I think he's been pretty good this year. And he looked great in this game too. He had a breakaway that uh, that got stopped off a good save. He could have had two goals in this game. The play that Comtois made to get the puck to him was really nice, and for him to control that and put that in the back of the net is what you really, you know, all you can expect from a player like Danton Heinen. And, uh, you know, it's kind of ridiculous at this point that we, we make these jokes that, that he could be scratched next game, and, and they're not really only jokes. It, it could be a possibility be, because right. he's had good games, and the next game he ends up being scratched, and it, it's Derek Grant or Delorier or Agazino or somebody like that who takes his place. And uh, I, you know, every time he comes into the lineup, he'll do a couple things that I'm like, why? Why has this guy ever been scratched? Like, how has he been scratched this much this year? And, and the same can be said for Trevor Zegras and and a few other guys who've been, you know, found the the press box during some of the games lately. That you sit back and and really wonder, like, why are you being scratched at this point? You know, we traded Nick Ritchie for Danton Heinen, and I don't think Danton Heinen's ever really done anything wrong. Like, I, I really can't say, like, I can sit back and I understand why Sam Steele has been scratched because I've seen the errors and, and, you know, the progression hasn't been there and he hasn't been that good. You know, Danton Heinen, yes, he's made mistakes, but I legitimately can't sit here and say that he deserves to be a scratch as much as he has been. Maybe one or two games this year, but the amount that he's actually sat out is, is pretty ridiculous based off what he's given to this team. No, I completely agree. I think uh, I think they said this at the end of, of January, maybe early uh, February, where they made a comment about he Aikens made the comment that he was being scratched because they want to see more offense from him. And that's so frustrating for me, because if you're asking if that's the, the measuring stick you're using, I think you're already setting yourself up for failure, because I don't think, um, you know, as much as early in the season, it looked like he just had this random perfect one-timer that we had never seen and we've seen him make good plays and we've seen him take nice shots and passes and all that kind of crap um you know he's not lost on offense but the fact of it is, is he is more valuable as a supporting winger um doing some of the dirty work playing good defense all of that kind of stuff and so i think you know it really is like ask an elephant to climb a tree kind of a thing and so it feels even more disappointing because it's not even like he isn't looking effective when he's playing. Like you said, it's just, they seem to just be asking him to do something that he's not really the player to do. Yeah, did, and that's very, they're asking him to do something that nobody else on this team can do consistently. And that's put <laughs> up offense. I mean, you, you nailed it in terms yeah. of what he is. And that's a nice complimentary piece to a very good team. And you look at what he was in Boston. That's what he was. He was a third line, you know, checking, scoring winger who could contribute offensively. And sometimes he jumped up into the top six when guys were injured and, and did a job. That's exactly what Danton Heinen is. And really, that's what he's done this year. But the Ducks don't have that many players that, you know, that, that can really compliment him and, and a, in front of him offensively where he can kind of slide into that yeah. role with the Ducks. Right. It's not even compliment. It's 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 support or support's almost the wrong one. It's he's the support piece, yeah. right? He is the the thing that you put in there. They're like, okay, perfect. Now this is complete. Um, and so yeah, what you're seeing is just again, we keep coming back to it. There's just a lack of high end offensive talent on this team. In a way that means 
the team's just not going to be able to compete on most nights. And, you know, maybe if they were doing something like a Trots or a Tortorella system, you know, maybe you could say this team could use systems and team defense to put together enough of something in front of John Gibson that we're going to get something out of it. But clearly that's not what's happening this year. So it feels, you know, that they're asking certain players to do things they're not doing and they're setting the team up to do things that maybe it's not equipped to do. But at the same time, I don't know that it's better if they're losing games in overtime and moving up points and all that kind of crap. It's almost a blessing the degree to which there seems to be, um, you know, a misevaluation of talent and misvaluation of the roster. Yeah, I mean, the, the Ducks have plenty of guys who are those nice complimentary pieces you can plug into a lineup. I mean, the the entire team is almost essentially that. When you look at, right. you know, Danton Heinen's a nice piece that you can plug into a very good team, and he'd, he'd do a job. Silverberg, Henry, Troy Terry, Max Jones, you know, they're all kind of those guys that you, you plug them in somewhere uh, on a team that has that support in front of them, and they would do a job, and they would look great there. But the Ducks don't have that support in front of them, so now you're asking the guys to do a lot more than they're really capable of, and that's where we get to you know the offensive struggles that the Ducks have had over the last couple seasons, and it's you know a lack of true firepower and creativity in their offense. And and when you know the the Avs that team is kind of the perfect example. For how long were the Avs bad, but they still had one of the best lines in the NHL and Landis Cog, McKinnon, and Rontanen? They finally added those support pieces that the Ducks have plenty of them, and they've become a complete team. And now, you know, they're first in goals against and they're third in goals for the Avs are uh, because they just have a complete team. And you look at those forward group and they all kind of complement each other, and everybody does a role, uh, and everybody knows their place in that roster, and, and they all follow the lead of that top line offensively. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the Ducks just have a lot of nice pieces, but they don't have that line. And not, and not a lot of teams do, but they don't have those go-to offensive guys. When you look at, you know, a team like Florida where it's Barkov and Huberto, uh, and, you know, with, with the Avalanche, it's those mm-hmm. three, and, and Boston has their kind of top line. And, and every really good team in, in this league has those kind of go-to guys and then the pieces behind them. We're... Right, game yeah, we're, we're We've got you know a nice piece when Trevor Zegras, but he's young and he's a piece. And you need some more guys to go along with that, and that's what we're talking about being at the top end of this draft and potentially the top end of next year's draft. You hopefully get those pieces, and then you kind of move into uh, you know building a team like some of these other teams have. And you know one guy we got to talk about tonight too as well is, is Troy Terry looked excellent. I thought he was mm-hmm. easily the, the best forward on the ice. For the Ducks tonight, there was a, a play he made. Uh, I think it was in the second period where he protected the puck and, and danced around like three Avalanche players. We tweeted it out yeah. on the Forever Mighty account, and uh, you know those are some things that we've seen from Troy Terry over the last little stretch here, uh, as well as the offensive production he scores tonight. In, in this game, had a couple other chances where you're kind of starting to see the player we all expected. And you know, like I've said multiple times, I'll happily eat my words. Uh, and Troy Terry and how critical I've been of him over the last couple seasons because he's starting to look like a very good player and one of those guys you have to keep around. And you can't help but think, you know, how much he's torched the abs this year that Joe Sackick is sitting in his office saying, you know, connecting the dots saying what a nice piece this would be to add to that abs team. Imagine Troy Terry playing on that second line that's struggling for the abs right now, you know, take out Brandon Saad and put uh, Terry with Kadri and Burakovsky. And uh, and what he could do there, I know there's a lot of GMs around the league that'd be kind of, uh, you know, licking their lips at bringing in a guy like Troy Terry and adding them to their roster. So, you know, if anything, he's uh, he's bumping the trade value, as we've been saying with a lot of guys uh, over the last little bit here. But uh, another nice game and a nice stretch here of, of good games for Troy Terry. So, real quick, uh, two things. Uh, so first and foremost, shout out to Cole Palmer, who does the Ducks hockey stat cards. Uh, he rocks. Uh, as you might have suspected, Troy Terry was in fact the best offensive, uh, the best player on Anaheim by Dom's uh, game score metric. He's the only Anaheim player over a one on the game score. For context, Kale McCarr led the game at five point six five. 
<laughs> and his average is 1.67. So he really played above his yep. head tonight. And Troy Terry's average is 0.51. Uh, and there are 12 guys ahead of him. Kale McCarr plus 11 other Avalanche the players had roster, uh, better basically. games than Troy Terry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so that's cool. And then we were joking about this earlier before we got on about how it's almost like one of these teams is a contender and one of them isn't. And I looked something up. So uh, the Colorado Avalanche lead the West with a uh, 34 games played, 22 wins, 8 losses, 4 overtime losses, and only one shootout loss. The Anaheim Ducks uh, are not that good. Uh, 11, 20, and 6 with uh, two shootout losses. Do you know what Colorado's goal differential is before this game? I only know their goal differential after the last twenty-five games because the broad or last ten games because the broadcast showed it on um, on TV. But over the last ten games, they're eight zero and two with a plus twenty-five five on five goal differential, which is just ridiculous. But uh, yeah, they're plus forty-one on the year. Yeah, it, it, I'm not surprised. You want to guess what? Do you want to guess what Anaheim's goal? I differential believe it's is? in the minus forties now. Is it not? It is, in fact, minus 40. And now, after tonight, uh, it'll be minus 43. Oh, boy. What was um, Detroit's yeah. a couple seasons ago when it was really awful? I think it was like minus 60 oh. or 70 or something, right? Or it was getting close I to minus 100. I think it was, yeah, it was way high. Because at one point, their goal, they had a worse goal differential than they did. Goals for or something. Yeah, uh, was... Total points, like on this yeah, season. It was bad. Like, it was I mean, we're not that bad yet, but we're getting there. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, we're on our way. Um, but yeah, no, it's just you know, just I, I, goal differential isn't necessarily one of those things that can tell you a lot. But when you're looking at bad teams and good teams, I think one of them uh, being plus forty one and the other being forty negative uh, is very uh, revealing. Yeah. Well, it, it's statistically to the first in the West versus the last in the West right now so right. Uh, you know this is kind of what uh what you could expect along those trade terry talks and um and i guess trade talks in a sense we had our uh, patreon show on sunday where steven and i came up with five different potential trades for the ducks before the deadline and one of the trades that you had involved Troy terry going to the colorado avalanche uh you know a Denver University uh, product. Mm. You're familiar with playing in the state of Denver. Kind of just seems like he'd fit that system. What was that that trade again? I know it was um, Belmar and Newhook coming back from Colorado for Terry and a couple other guys. Terry, Manson, and uh, Miller. Right, yeah, Terry, Terry Manson and Miller uh, to Colorado for Belmar and Newhook. I don't know if Belmar is coming over now with this fight with Ryan Getzlaff after this game. They were they were kind of getting at it all game. Um, Dude, he got a free one in on him, man. I, I would be pissed too. And let me be very clear. I'm not, you know, I'm not here to bag on Belmar. for Like, I love that shit. Like, you know, it's not like, you know, Ryan Getzlaff or Ryan Kessler or Corey Perry didn't, didn't do that at one point or another. Like, I'm not... It doesn't offend me that he did it, but like I also understand why the dude who he did it to is less than pleased about it, <laughs> and is like, yeah, yeah, well, this isn't going well, so I'm going to use that as a pretense to uh, throw down a little bit. Well, when they fought, or almost fought earlier in the game, <clears throat> I tweeted out that does yeah, Getzlaff and Belmar are fighting tonight. I I had to wait a little bit, but I got later on in in the uh, third period. All good things. And they uh, they eventually fought, so you know. I'll, I'll pat myself on the back for that. Not one. a bad little scrap. Either. But uh, you know, to go along with your trade, where you had Ryan Miller going to the Avalanche, uh, we talked about that LeBron article earlier in the show, and uh, in that article, they had a, a team executive proposal, which was the fifth of that article, where it was the Ducks trading Ryan Miller to the Avalanche for a conditional fourth round pick uh, for or twenty twenty two, which is Anaheim's choice, and it says that it can improve to a third if Miller plays fifty percent of the playoff games in any ran round and if Colorado advances to the league semifinals. So piggybacking on that trade and then your trade proposal, if the Ducks could somehow package, you know, Miller and Terry and, you know, maybe Manson or somebody else and bring and somehow pry Newhook away from the Avalanche, you know, that's again, we talk about, you know, what type of trade should the Ducks be making at the deadline? I don't want to give up on Troy Terry by any means. 
Uh, I, I've firmly moved out of that camp just based off how he's played over the last little bit. Here he's really the only guy that stepped up for the Ducks. But again, if uh, if it's mean, you know, bringing in a guy like Alex Newhook, uh, who's you know firmly a top twenty-five NHL prospect right now, uh, I think it's a move mm-hmm. you explore uh, and, and one you could go to, and, and is one that seems to make sense. And and you know, um, LeBron goes over that in his article why Ryan Miller would make sense for the Avs, and he'd make sense for a lot of teams right now uh, that are struggling to find a netminder. Philly was the one uh, in our trade piece on Patreon where I had Ryan Miller going. Uh, mm-hmm. For for my favorite deal of that uh, of that Patreon, I'll tease it like that. If you want to find out what that deal is, you have to sign up for our Patreon and uh, there you go. Look <laughs> and that. go. That's an expert and right go there. listen to That's that show. Vet. But Let it was uh, as Stephen will reluctantly admit, it was our favorite trade of uh, of the ten trades. Yeah, it together. really, yeah, it really got me. That Philly trade was sweet. I liked it. I hated it. And knowing it. our luck, it none of those off. trades will actually happen. Actually, the only one that will probably happen is the Derek Grant for Jake Vertanen trade with the conditional seventh round pick in there. That will probably be the only one that actually happens before the deadline here. Ben Hut, future considerations. God, we can only hope. But you know, we're we're nearing close now. To the trade deadline, April is uh, only a couple days away. Thursday is April first. The trade deadline, I believe, is April twelfth. Twelfth. Um, so we're we're less than two weeks away now from the trade deadline. The quarantine period in Canada, if you guys haven't seen it, has been reduced from fourteen days to seven. So that makes it a little bit easier if the Ducks were again trying to nail down, let's say, a Ricard Raquel deal with Toronto. Uh, you know that makes it a bit uh, bit easier to make that deal happen. Now they don't have to extend past the 14 day cor- quarantine period like they were before. But we're getting into that crunch time, right? And we know Bob Murray doesn't make too many deals on deadline day. It's usually a couple days in advance. So we're mm, that's a common misconception. So he makes a lot of deals on deadline day. He makes his biggest moves yes. before deadline. He day. makes the yes. big moves, but he does make. 800 AHL transactions on deadline <laughs> so, day for no Derek reason Grant and uh, Nick Delorier and all the other kind of smaller roster players on this team will get moved on deadline day. But exactly. if we're going to see a Raquel trade... Then we'll lose the guys we get them for on waivers, yeah. and it'll be a whole thing. But we're closing in on, on the time period here. If, if a Ricard Raquel deal is going to happen, that kind of gets complicated with his injury because he missed this game. Uh, if we're going to see Danton Heinen, if we're going to see... Josh Manson, if we're going to see really any of the big names get moved on this team, we're, we're kind of closing in on that deadline for that to happen. And as each day goes by, you start to kind of feel like it's more and more likely not to happen. And this Ricard Raquel injury was such a kind of a heartbreaker for any potential trade um, because that's going to lower the value. But we already knew Bob Murray was sticking high on his price. Mm-hmm. And unless Ricard Raquel gets back, over the you know the next couple of games, the Ducks do have four days off. They don't play Arizona until Friday. You would have to hope that if he's not in the lineup on Friday, that kind of kiboshes any potential Ricard Raquel trade before the deadline. You would think, and and that's a that's a big blow to the Ducks. I mean, we've we've mentioned before he's still a guy you can move at the draft, but it almost feels like you you've got to do something big at or before the deadline here just to to calm things down a bit, right? Like you can't. You can't get it. Take some of the air you out. You can't yeah. get out of this deadline. And the only thing you've done is trade Antoine Moran for Alexander Volkov. I, I just, I, I can't see it. I, I, that can't be your only move. No, I don't. I don't think you can. I, I really think uh, making trades is going to be one of the few things, if not the only thing, at this point that he can do. Uh, to kind of earn back the very vocal segment of the fan base that's kind of really starting to get fed up. You know, I think it's interesting, DB mentioned in the chat, uh, how does Raquel's injury impact the team's expansion draft? And I think that's a great question, but I think more than anything, the first question is, is how does it affect the trade deadline? Which, like you said, you know, if, if it's not a serious injury and they can comfortably tell other teams... It's not a big deal. You know what I mean? He's gone through the protocol. We trust it. We've been diligent. He had the full time off, yada, yada, yada. Then he can still get moved and they can still get, you know, Rodion Amarov or, you know, one of these kind of guys that we're we're all kind of hoping they can pull out of their Cam York. Um, But if he doesn't get moved and we don't see him play for more than a few games, uh, you know what I mean? Like, I think if he misses another two, three games, 
especially after the break, I think then it becomes a problem. And then you start to get into, well, what do we do? And, you know, you have the, the regular draft and the expansion draft and all these different things. And, you know, if you're trading or if you're protecting a player just to trade them, like, why wouldn't you have done it earlier? And so uh, as much as it's the cart before the horse and there's time between now and then, I do think uh, depending on what kind of injury it is and severity of it, it, it could really mess Anaheim up for the expansion draft. Yeah. So I think it does put a lot more pressure on Bob Murray to really make sure he's getting all of his ducks in a row going in. And, and we really are limited on, you know, the big trades that we could potentially get because I guess the three big pieces on the Ducks forward group, um, I don't know if these are the three biggest pieces, but at least salary wise, gets left. Uh, Henrik and Silverberg all have some sort of no-move clause or modified no-trade trade clause. And in Getzlaff's case, uh, as Bob Murray stated several times, Getzlaff is only going if he wants to go, which makes sense. I think he deserves that. Uh, he's not a guy I want to see go anyway. Yeah. Um, you know, Although you did bring up a pretty good trade uh, of Getzlaff going to the Minnesota Wild on our on our Patreon show. I'm going to keep mentioning that because that was a fun show. But uh <laughs> there, that was a, a trade I might be convinced to lose Getzlaff just for this season. We can re-sign him at the end of the season. But um, Henrik's no-trade clause is a 10-team no-trade list. Uh, Silverberg's is a 12-team no-trade list. That's not the most team-friendly no-trade clause to have in there. Uh, eliminates at least a third you know of the what? teams that you could potentially trade him to. But it's only a third, right? It's 10 and 12. Like, yeah, 10 and 12 is 10 and 12 more teams that you can't talk to or, you know, whatever. But, like, at the end of the day, like, <laughs> if those are the only 10 teams that you had a shot to, then you are bad at your job. You know, yeah, they're going to have to get creative. They're going to have to take salary back. They're going to have to retain salary. They might have to, you know, add a mid-round pick to help kind of offset. You know what I mean? It's going to – Anaheim is going to have to get weird and interesting and – creative if they want to have uh the kind of impact at the deadline that they should want to have and that they can have the question is going to be is has is a front office that has very traditionally been against any kind of creativity as far as roster construction are they going to want to do that like are they going to be a different people you know for the next two weeks than they were for the last 12 years like i just don't think it's going to happen. And so, you know, it's, uh, it's frustrating to say, but it's almost the best thing for Anaheim. Anaheim's future could be a bad trade deadline because if it goes bad enough and we start to really see, you know, guys like Chris Johnson and Bob McKenzie and Elliot Friedman, and we, you know, I, we start to see him, Bob Murray kind of turn into freaking Danny Ainge where it's all the trades he almost made. I think that could put a lot of heat on him. Um, so you're saying more conditional he, seventh round picks is what we need. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I'm saying we need a lot of seventh round picks so that we can trade them all for one sixth round pick and then take a guy who <laughs> plays. We'll take years. a guy who's worse than somebody took in the seventh round pick with one of the seventh round picks we gave up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's going to be worse than the future Hall of Famer we didn't pick. Exactly. But it it really does beg the question: like the Ducks are primed right now to lose this trade deadline, be- just because. <laughs> just because it is di- more difficult like i mean not only the no trade clauses with with henrik and silverberg but the salaries that they carry and trying to move those out you look at the two big pieces uh, outside of lindholm who's injured right now on the blue line are cam fowler and josh manson manson has his own 12 team no trade list that he has to submit cams is basically unmovable because he submits a four team trade list <laughs> he only has four teams that he could potentially go to okay real quick I wanted to talk about this because this is a thought that hit me the other day a little sideways and we might as well talk about it here. Do you think his agent reaches out to teams and goes, uh, which one of you teams doesn't have any interest in trading for Cam Fowler? And then he puts four teams that explicitly say no on there. Uh, Or do you think they just, I've always speculated that if uh, Cam ever had to submit that list, Detroit's probably always on it, no matter how bad they are or not, just because he's from Michigan. Outside of that, I have no idea what other three teams could ever be on that list for, for Cam Fowler? Um, that, that, that contract in that situation, unless you seem to, you just magically find the right partner there. Uh, I, I don't mm-hmm. think it's ever moved and it's not a deadline deal to begin with. Here either. we go. Here we go. Cam Fowler for Tyler Myers and a third round pick. 
I just I honestly would rather just keep Cam at that point. I I don't even I'm not okay. privy to, to Myers' deal, but I believe it is still like a four or five year deal, right? I think he signed, yeah, it's a five by six. It's not not exactly fine. I mean, you get a third round pick, but then you have to then you have to have Tyler Myers <laughs> for six years. It's true. So. But he is like six foot six, so that's yeah. We just we just go trade for all the tall boys, right? Yep, that's the way to do it. That's how I'd do it if I was. But in you know, to finish off this trade deadline discussion here, like Gibby's not getting moved before at the deadline. Uh, Fowler is not likely just because of that. You heard it here. All the things considered, we're taking a stand. Um, Gibby's not traded. That's it. We've drawn a line in the sand. We're revolutionary there, right? That's saying Gibby isn't going to get traded. Um, You know, Manson's probably the most likely from that blue line in terms of being an actual big trade outside of Hampus. But again, Hampus is injured. Like, good luck trading Hampus right now while injured if you want to get full value for him. Um, Manson, you could likely find you know one of those twenty-seven, not twenty-seven. Whatever, how many, 20, 20 teams, 20 or 19 teams that 19. are, are uh, still available to trade him to that could be interested in him? I guess 18, because 31 is us. Yeah, true. I, I The 32 always 18. keeps going in my mind because of Seattle, but we're not there yet. Um, so that yeah. i got to kind of back that out there. I'm sure, you know, it's a potential deal that could work, but, you know, what if there's only five teams interested in him and four of them are on that no tr- no trade list? And then you've only got one team you got to deal with. You lose all your leverage there potentially, in in any deal for for Manson. And the same kind of goes for Henrik and Silverberg. Yet their contracts are a little bit harder to move than Manson is. Like you can eat fifty percent of Manson's contract if you want. And we mentioned that again on our Patreon episode, where you can eat fifty percent of Manson's deal, and it doesn't affect you uh, for you know any anything beyond next season. Uh, whereas if you were to eat you know two million off Henrik's deal or two million off Silverberg's deal. That's hitting you for the next four or five years, uh, which is a little bit of, of a harder pill to swallow. And and the bit. only big trade piece you had on Ford is now hurt in Ricard Raquel. And, um, you know, they already had a high price on him. I don't think they're going to come down from it. And every team that was now engaged in Ricard Raquel is going to say, well, man, he's injured. I'm not going to pay what I was going to pay before. And I'm definitely not paying the price that you want. Um, you know, we'll see what the desperation of the trade deadline brings about here. Uh, when other guys start moving off the board and guys like maybe Taylor Hall or Philip Forsberg, whoever, start moving. And if Ricard Raquel becomes the last guy available, there might be a few desperate teams out there like there are every year. Uh, but it really does feel like if the big piece is going to be anybody this year, it, it's going to be Ricard Raquel because there really isn't anybody else that's uh, you know a prime candidate to get moved at this point. Yeah, no, I, I don't know. Uh, you know, They don't really have anything... Um, that I think makes sense as an in-season trade, unless, you know, and I, I just think for a number of reasons, and a lot of which have to just do with the crazy situation that the season is happening in, you know, it would have to be Gibson would be the big one. He's the only one really left, um, you know, as far as players that are questionably in the time frame of when you want to compete for Anaheim and things like that. And I think, you know, it, it just makes so much more sense as an off season move. Uh, you know, maybe somebody gets hurt and that changes something. Um, you know, maybe somebody values someone randomly or, you know, maybe they get a good pick for Heinen or a decent pick for steel or something like that. But I, I really do think, that it's 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 very unlikely, especially with Raquel getting hurt now, that a lot happens. Um, you know, I, I wonder about maybe they can trade Hockenpah somewhere, or uh, I, I'm very curious about trading Shattenkirk somewhere. I would be really interested to know how that would go, because he's making less than four million for two more years. They could retain easy on yeah. that. And and I think there would still be teams you know. who'd be interested in Shattenkirk just based off the impact he had in a good team uh, with Tampa Bay. You know, I think a lot of people can sure, explain like it. Vegas. Yeah, uh, I think you can explain it away to yourself that you know he's in Anaheim and Anaheim sucks. You know, look what he did last year, and it's all true. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and you you retain if the Ducks retain, you know, thirty to fifty percent of that deal. I think there'd be a lot of teams interested in it. So that could be a surprise big one we see, but. In the same sense, we've talked about everybody else here. Shattenkirk has his own 12-team no-trade list. 
he has to submit. So that does immediately take 12 teams off the board. We, you, know, you look at the while we wrap this up here, we look at the last kind of big trades the, the last two years the Ducks have made. It was Andre Kasha and Brandon Montour. Um, for me, and and I hate to say it, I think you know I don't want to put money on it, but I'll I'll make my bet this and in, in that the big trade we we could see is Sam Steele getting traded out of Anaheim just just purely on Bob Murray wanting to make a move and and it for me it would be that hockey type trade of him trading Sam Steele for another kind of 22 23 year old forward somewhere else in the league uh not one I would want mm-hmm. uh, not one I I hope that happens uh but I think if he gets desperate and Ricard Raquel isn't moved and Shattenkirk isn't moved uh, you know I think Heinen is is kind of a foregone conclusion at this point yeah there's no way he's still on this team which is a bummer man that really bums me out but he's he's basically a rental as a as a restricted free agent at the end of this season um not not a pure rental but you know one in the same sense that his contract expires i so i think he's an easy one to say that would be moved but in terms of the big kind of surprise deal it's not a major one but i think sam Steele could be that guy i just you know bob murray keeps talking about how the young guys have to step up and if they don't they're going to get moved and everybody else is kind of taking that step forward this year and Sam Steele, and to my surprise, I, has been the one guy that just hasn't gotten it going this year. So, um, you know, if, if I had to put money on it and, and one of those guys was going to be moved, I think it might be Sam Steele at this point. Yeah. Uh, so, all right, real quick, as even more of a teaser for our Patreon episode, since that was a lot of fun, um, and I didn't get to talk about Canadian teams because Eddie's a fascist. Um, let me ask you, do you know how much uh, newfound Fran uh, Dylan DeMello made? Three million, because I had him in. I had uh, him in my trade. Yeah, so dude, not bad. Honestly, a DeMello Shattenkirk trade is fascinating. It is. To me. It, you know what? It, it honestly isn't that bad because if you're the Ducks, like you said, just a fifty percent retain on Shattenkirk. Who cares? It's just for next year. 50% retained. He's got another year yep. after it. Yep. Just, you know what? You could even do, um, we can make this a Shattenkirk and Steel deal. It's a 50% retained Shattenkirk and Sam Steele for Dylan DeMello and, you know, grab a, grab a prospect there. Grab a Vili Heinola or a, yeah. uh, you know, it's obviously Colby Freddy's not coming back, but a Christian Veselainen or a second round pick or, you know, maybe snatch their first round pick because they're a very good team this year. Uh, to be able to add Shattenkirk and uh, and Steele, and I think Shattenkirk is probably the type of defenseman they'd be looking for more of a just a pure offensive minded mm-hmm. guy to quarterback their power play. It's uh, you know I don't know if Winnipeg wants to move from Dylan DeMello, but I, as somebody put in the chat too, I think Dave put in here Shattenkirk to Winnipeg for a prospect. It becomes one of those deals that you can talk yourself into that makes a ton of sense. Uh, I think the only sticking point there is is Bob Murray willing to admit that he. I don't want to say it was wrong, but it was wrong about the team to Here's bring Shattenkirk in. He doesn't have to. He doesn't have to do that. He's trading a what? How old is Shattenkirk? Twenty. I think he's in his twenty nine. Yeah, he might be in his thirties now, or maybe it's just because he's like bald already that he he looks a lot older. Oh my god. Thirty two. Thirty two. You're right. It's weird that him and Cam Fowler are on the same track, and Cam's three years younger. Um, but you know, I, I you know. Going from Shattenkirk to DeMello is exactly the kind of trades he's been talking about all year, about wanting to get younger but still have guys within a contending window. So um, eh, here's the other one I have for you. And before anybody from outside yells at us, let's just remember this is for fun because we're allowed to do that, guys. Uh, Would you do this year's second, next year's second, Josh Manson and Ricard Raquel for... Willie Nylander. I'd take out one of the seconds. and uh, So that was my original thought, was this year's second Manson and Raquel for Nylander. Yeah. I, that was my... I, I probably uh, would, um, but I know Nylander's contract isn't the nicest thing in the world, but you you do pretty much wash it for the, the next couple seasons with uh, with Manson and Ricard Raquel's combined about $8 million, uh, kind of making the difference. Four-year-old... 24 year old top line forward making less than seven a million a year for three more years after this. I think one. I think if you're the Leafs, you you, you I don't know if you say, I would say love that deal, but it, you do get some shorter contracts there in Manson and Raquel. 
Um, and Raquel coming into, he's not Nylander, but coming into that lineup and playing with John Tavares, I think you could expect a, a similar production. Uh, not exactly the same and not exactly the same impact on the lineup, but then Josh Manson kind of makes right. up the difference there on the blue line for them. Yeah. Absolutely. And then the second round pick is a bit of a sweetener and they'd probably use that second round pick to go out and get another forward to potentially, you know, supplement the loss of, of Nylander and add somebody else to that line with, with Tavares and uh and Raquel. Give them Sam Steele. They can have Sam Steele. I'll throw him in I like how Sam Steele is. I don't want to trade biscuit. him, but now he's yeah. become. Yeah, throw him in there. Throw him in there. We'll see what we can get he's, with him. He's a biscuit, man. We'll just throw him in the bag and call it a day. D.B. Lowry threw uh, some water on our Shannon Creek to Winnipeg. Um, trade rumor saying that uh, there's well, absolutely wants to be no way Winnipeg would be on Kevin Shattenkirk's, uh, would, would escape <laughs> Kevin Shattenkirk's 12 team no trade list. They would have to be firmly. On that, the guys played in New York and uh, Tampa and Anaheim over the last little bit here. He either wants a big city or a nice, nice, cozy, warm place to play. So I can't imagine Winnipeg is near the top of his list when it comes to teams that he'd want to go to. I don't know. Seems like the same thing to me. I don't know why Winnipeg and Tampa Bay aren't the same. Maybe the Florida Panthers, who just lost one Aaron Eckler. Yeah. (laughs) Ooh. Ooh. Mm. Don't even bring up Ke- uh, Keith Yandel's name. I'm going to end the show now. I won't. Bring him home. <laughs> bring Keith Yandel home. All right. Well, we're getting uh, close to the hour 15 mark here, so we'll wrap up the show. Um, and we've mentioned it a uh, you know, hundred times already tonight, but uh, Stephen and I did record a Patreon episode on Sunday where we looked at some trade options Ooh. for the Ducks. It was a lot of fun. Uh, we had a couple of new Patreon members who joined us uh, a couple weeks ago, so nice to have them out and listening to the first show. Uh, we have Pucks and Brews scheduled for the month of April, uh, a couple of them, so if you want to check those out, that's our flagship show there, and uh, that's always a lot of fun. Our Patreon is patreon.com slash forevermighty, and we do about two bonus episodes a month, plus we have a Discord chat where we talk with well, all the listeners and, and have a lot of fun in there, so if you guys do want to check that out, uh, make sure... Make fun yeah, of Pat. Yeah, make fun of Pat a lot. <laughs> so make... Make sure to go check that out. Uh, I know Stephen has a couple uh, interviews of, of his own uh, lately that uh, that will be coming out hopefully in the month of April. And then Stephen and I are sitting down with Josh Bell to get a early look at who the Ducks could get uh, in this year's upcoming draft. That will be coming, I think, just after the trade deadline or just before the trade deadline, right? Yeah, we're going to try to keep it as close to the trade deadline as possible. We're hoping to get it in before. Um, so that way we can maybe talk about some of the guys that are a little deeper in the draft that Anaheim could target with, you know, middle seconds or late firsts, uh, because obviously we know we're going to talk about the guys at the top where they're going to be, but, uh, there is the possibility of Anaheim picking up some trades, uh, some extra draft picks, this trade, which was kind of the impetus for thinking of doing that and bringing Josh on. Josh is a real smart guy and he writes, or he used to write at, uh, hockey writers and now, I don't know, he's in charge of something somewhere he's very smart and important yeah so it's always nice uh to kind of get a break here and talk about the 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 you know bright <laughs> the bright things. light at the end of the tunnel here <laughs> and uh what the ducks can get uh, uh, having potentially a top uh you know top three pick or in the upcoming draft year likely first or second overall unless they fall in the lottery so it'll be interesting to kind of get that look and in a nice break from the monotony I'm talking about a Ducks loss and uh, Trevor Zegers being scratched and a lot of stuff. So it'd be nice to, to kind of look on the positive side. So keep a, keep an eye out for that. We do have a bit of a break here over uh, this week. The Ducks don't play again until Friday against Arizona. So we'll be back live after that game with another post-game show. So you won't hear from us a little bit over the week here. Um, but like I said, we are going to try and get a, uh, a Patreon show out, uh, hopefully you know either this week or this weekend. Uh, to kick things off in April uh, on, on a good start here. I know it's uh, a long weekend for a lot of you, so if you don't uh, if you don't hear from us on Friday, hope you guys have uh, you know great Easter with your families, uh, and uh, we'll see you out there for the next show. Thanks for coming out, guys. Take care. Bye. Bye, everybody.